Hey guys, so this episode will be talking a lot about violence and abuse, so if those are some touchy subjects for some of our listeners out there, this might be an episode to skip. Alright, enjoy! Hey guys, I'm Avni. And I'm Diva. And welcome back to Positionality. We're, today we're going to be talking about femicide in Turkey. So, Diva, have you heard of the recent, I guess, Instagram hashtag challenge accepted? Yeah, so I've been seeing it a lot on, like, my Instagram Explore page, especially. So for those of you who don't know, this is essentially a challenge or trend where a lot of women on Instagram have been posting black and white selfies of themselves, accompanied by the hashtag challenge accepted. So honestly, (laughs) when I first saw this, I just thought it was another excuse for people to take photos of themselves. But once I actually looked into it, I found out that it was connected to reports of femicide victims in Turkey. Yeah, so actually, along with the social media campaign, protests across Turkey over the past summer have highlighted the rise in femicide, or the murder of women solely due to the fact that they're women. Um, It's also highlighted the rise of domestic violence in Turkey. So as you said, social media... trend uh, social media feeds were filled with black and white selfies of women and all of them actually resemble reports of femicide victims so every day in turkish newspapers there are black and white photos of women who have been murdered next to the details of their murder this challenge was one way to stand in solidarity with these women first of all can we just talk about the fact that this happens every single day exactly that's huge In fact, these protests, actually, or this challenge, was recently sparked by uh, the murder of Pinar Gultekin, a 27-year-old Turkish woman who went missing and was found dead on July 21st, 2020. This happened in the city of Mugla after she allegedly rejected her boyfriend's advances. He strangled her to death, burned her body in an oil barrel, and then tried to hide it in the woods. Now, her alleged killer blamed his ex-girlfriend for his actions, stating that she threatened to let his wife know about the relationship and killed her in a moment of rage. So you're telling me that this woman was killed by her boyfriend because she might have been t- she might have told his wife that he was cheating, and yet the blame was put on the woman. Pretty much, this has been justified by any justice system in Turkey. Unfortunately, this killing also marked the 50th known murder of women in Turkey in 2020 alone. It sparked outrage across the country, where women's rights advocates and allies are urging the Turkish government to take action to prevent these deaths. It's honestly crazy to me that something as simple as a hashtag, which I thought was, you know, just for fun, pretty normal thing, is responsible for bringing awareness to a topic as severe and important as this. Definitely. I also think it's interesting to look at, I guess, the news cycle, which has become a theme across episodes in our podcast. But the way that the, I guess, purpose of this hashtag was kind of watered down. Um, I know whenever I saw a lot of celebrities posting with this hashtag, they posted it along the lines of women's empowerment. Or, oh, look, feminism, you know, and while that is part of the basis, the actual issue was not at all discovered. I mean, I know people in my personal life who did this challenge as just like a fun way to empower women to have more self-esteem and not realizing the gravity of what it actually was. Mm -hmm. In fact, the general secretary of the campaign group, We Will Stop Femicide, They said that violence against women is a problem everywhere. In Turkey, they have a strong women's rights movement, but they also face a lot of opposition, which I guess would contribute to why we don't see this at all in the media. Um, In the last 20 years, society alone has changed a lot. More women are demanding for their right to work and go to university. However, the more choices women have, the more intense this backlash gets. It's interesting that the secretary said that because... I've seen that throughout history with women's rights. For example, with the beauty myth. When women in America were beginning to get more jobs, beauty standards began to be put upon them to sort of pressure them into looking a certain way in order to be accepted by society. Definitely. I think we also saw this most recently with the debate on abortions, especially with the confirmation of Justice Amy Coney Barrett. 
Um, it's almost like women got their right to their own body and, or autonomy over their own body. And now that's being contested and likely might get taken away from women. Even after a century, it feels like we're back in the same place. It's like we take a couple steps forward, but then take a lot more steps backward. And that keeps us in the same place. Yeah. This is actually, it's interesting that we brought up the whole idea of political affiliations with, I guess, religious and culture affiliations, because the same kind of pattern is seen in Turkey. So, of course, women in Turkey are subjected to violence regardless of their socioeconomic status, which makes sense because that occurs in almost every domestic violence or domestic abuse case. But unlike many countries around the world, laws are in place in Turkey to prevent and combat violence against women. It's interesting that if laws are put in place, why is this still happening? And more importantly, why was last year having one of the highest rates of femicide? Yeah. So unfortunately, when it comes to implementing these laws, there have been a lot of failures um, that leave women unprotected from male violence. The government's patriarchal approach is one of the main barriers to the implementation of legislation that's already in the books. Have you heard of the Istanbul Convention? Yeah, so I heard about it recently. And from what I know about it, it was sought out to criminalize gender-based violence, which I assume was a good thing. So you're exactly right. It is wanting to criminalize gender-based violence and provide women with necessary measures, including like legal defense, protection, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to prevent violence against women. This was enacted in 2011, and then in 2012, they adopted Law Number 6,284, which I'm assuming most people don't know. I definitely don't. <laughs> but it is basically to protect uh, the family and prevent violence against women. And the ruling Justice and Development Party, or the AKP in Turkey, they launched national action plans for gender equality. Now, keep in mind, the AKP is, I guess, the conservative faction. The current president, President Erdogan, he's part of this party. So considering that it appears to be that even the conservative party is pushing for progressive values, you'd think that the situation would be better for women. Yeah, I mean... If, the, if in the U.S., conservative people were pushing for progressive measures, our political landscape would look very different. Definitely. However, the Turkish system is still unable to protect women. This is because a lot of the neoliberal economic policies of the AKP go hand in hand with the religious conservatism. Um, this basically enforces socially constructed roles that equate womanhood with a sacred motherhood or maintaining the traditional Turkish family model. Conservative circles in Turkey, for instance, claim that laws promoting gender equality and providing protective mechanisms for women are actually tearing families apart. So because of their efforts to raise awareness among women about their rights, the same circles are currently pushing the government to abolish both the Istanbul Convention and Law Number 6284. These are some of the most major accomplishments for women in Turkey, and yet those are the same ones being taken away. I can't believe that people actually think that empowering women would somehow make them worse mothers, not better. You'd have to imagine that contributing, like going out to work, would contribute to the general economy or financial and fiscal needs of the household, which would be somehow be better, but for some reason, this conservatism, or I guess it's most similar to the idea of motherhood or Republican motherhood in America. This was an idea in the 1800s that suggested that women had to stay home and educate their children in order to make their children grow up and become, I guess, contributing members to society. Yeah, I know it was essentially based around the idea that Women were essential to their kids' lives, but so essential that they had to put all their time into taking care of the children. Yeah, but that was also a way for women to educate their children. And yet it seems that those kinds of, I guess, facilities are not necessarily being offered to women at that extent at all. Unfortunately, this 
effort to prioritize the preservation of family unity are costing women their lives, as you can imagine. These family-oriented policies emphasizing the role of women as housewives and mothers are expanding at the expense of their rights. Since the government perceives women's empowerment as a threat to the unity of family this, and the strength of the nation lies in the strength of families, as Erdogan puts it, the rights of women are ignored at the individual level. Unfortunately, small but powerful lobby groups have repeatedly petitioned for changes to the Istanbul Convention on the grounds that it encourages divorce and immoral lifestyles. First of all, let's just dissect that. Immoral lifestyle. Just with the example of Pinar Guldekin, her boyfriend is married. He has a wife. He killed her because he was afraid that she'd tell his wife. He's cheating on her, which should be considered immoral. And yet somehow she, in the eyes of the Turkish government or the patriarchal society of Turkey, is to blame. It's kind of similar to rape culture, especially at least in the U.S., where even when women are the ones being harmed and men are often the perpetrators of that, women are assumed as the ones to blame. I mean, when a woman is sexually assaulted, the first question they ask them isn't are you okay but it's what were you wearing yeah i've definitely seen posters around schools uh where they're like hey ladies if you don't want to get raped wear this wear this wear this don't wear this don't wear that and it's like why don't we just tell guys to not do that exactly instead of just enforcing rules on women that are supposed to protect them from the people who instead we could be educating I think one of the most prominent examples of this was a couple years ago uh, with the confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh. I believe her name is Dr. Chrissy Blasey Ford. She came forth with her story about a rape al- allegation related to Brett Kavanaugh, and yet she received a lot of death threats. She had to relocate because people were threatening to kill her and her life was on the line. And the best case scenario for him is that he got to be Supreme Court Justice. Exactly. A woman shouldn't be threatened for speaking out against violence. That should never be the case. Yeah, so another good thing is that the feminist movement and struggles for women in Turkey as a whole have kind of progressed. So women's empowerment has had a dual impact on domestic violence in Turkey, as more and more women who achieve economic independence are exercising their rights and refusing to stay in abusive marriages or relationships. I think we kind of saw this trend in the 1920s in America, where not necessarily the promiscuity of women, but just the acceptance of allowing women to be themselves and not necessarily abide to this conservative idea of what a woman should be, uh, enabled them culturally to kind of be whoever they wanted. With the emergence of flappers women were kind of socially allowed to do things that were traditionally male behaviors like smoke or just curse yeah uh we also saw this with the invention of abortion uh which was one of the first things that i guess went against this idea that women were only necessary to make or have children not to mention that in 1920 women gained the right to vote Yeah, that's major, especially politically, because now they had an important say in, I guess, important decisions regarding the future of their country and the place that they live in. In fact, one of the feminist scholars in Turkey, uh, Fatma Gul Berkte, she argued that a lot of men feel threatened because they're going through a crisis of masculinity due to the loss of their positions as breadwinners and protectors or maintainers of women, accusing women of not being obedient. Men are engaging in physical, sexual, psychological, or economic violence. In many cases of femicide in Turkey, the perpetrators are either ex-husbands or soon-to-be ex-partners. The Turkish government does not regularly release official statistics on femicide, but nearly every day, the media reports at least one woman being killed by a man. The government's reluctance to take a strong political stance on violence against women is encouraging male perpetrators, as you can imagine. Once again, we're seeing, as this has been repeated through history, that men are often excused from their behaviors. Like, 
what the scholar was saying that men are going through a crisis of masculinity as if men are the ones who are the victims here not the women who are the ones being assaulted yeah definitely and i think even with the amount of progress that they've made there's still a lot more to come as we've seen across the world um and various global and political uh contexts uh like with america we have the whole debate on abortion but we also have the gender gap in employment we have the pink tax etc cetera, etc cetera. here's the thing in turkey despite the gains that the women's movement has made in the past, their participation in the labor force is still extremely low. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or the OECD, only 34.2% of women in Turkey actually work, which is the lowest of the 35 industrialized countries. Wow. Can you imagine only a third of women working? Almost every single adult woman that I know either works now or has worked at some point in her life. And I think it's important to bring up that it's not that these women don't want to work. It's that it's not culturally allowed for them to do so. In America, I think, to an extent, women were still allowed to work or not necessarily in the same positions as men, but say teaching was a huge part throughout history. Uh, I remember with, I think we learned about this in AP U.S. History, last year but the Lowell factory or the Lowell mill where they offered women places to stay so that even though it was a low wage they could still work and not be dependent on men it's just interesting that there had to be a specific factory created so that women would feel socially allowed or obligated to work because otherwise they would just because of cultural values they wouldn't be able to yeah and we still see that gender segregation today i mean Uh, with wage gaps, wage differences, gender biases, all of that stuff, that's so prevalent. And as you can imagine, it's still a major issue in Turkey as well. Women are actually more likely to work in low-paid jobs or the informal sector without social security. Social security is, of course, one of the biggest things for retirement and future security. So not being able to have that would be particularly difficult for one to live off of, especially if their husband when, especially if you have to make the decision between working or having a secure financial life with a husband who could be abusive, you can imagine that the decision would be extremely difficult. And it's unfair that women are the only ones having to put up with this in Turkey. Men can work and men can also get married without the fear of social values getting in the way. Yeah, In fact, actually, this gender wage discrimination or high unemployment rates, it's a big issue for women as economic dependence on their partners is an important factor in stopping women from escaping domestic violence. According to Grevio, which is an independent organization that monitors the implementation of the Istanbul Convention, female victims of domestic violence in Turkey struggle to achieve economic independence and considerable effort should be made to help them acquire the necessary means to lead independent lives. And yet, we see constantly that there's always something that stops this from happening in the first place. I mean, you can imagine if you were in a situation where your husband was maybe abusive, if you, didn't, if you weren't economically independent, it wouldn't be possible for you to get out of that because you just wouldn't be able to survive. Yeah. And especially with the culture of Turkey, unfortunately, oftentimes this violence ultimately leads to femicide. So I know that we originally talked about how people were using social media as a way of protest. What was the government response to that like? Right. So, of course, there is a growth in censorship. Essentially, President Erdogan is working to tighten controls over social media in the country. In July, the Turkish parliament advanced a bill that would force social media companies or online platforms to be more responsive to the government's calls to remove posts it doesn't like. This sounds very, I guess, China-esque in regards to the Great Firewall or the Great Chinese Firewall. It definitely reminds me of the national security law in China and the censorship that especially Hong Kong citizens have to deal with. 
foreshadowing for a forthcoming episode. <laughs> yeah, but it's also very much reminiscent of North Korea because I'm assuming Lord Kim Jong Un is not about to have <laughs> people critique his dynasty. Exactly. Um, but yeah. Of course, this is going to have a major impact on the feminist movement in Turkey, as social media is one of the main ways these stories and issues are shared in the first place. If this is blocked, it's likely to stagnate progress for women um, when they're being forced into silence. According to NBC News, dissidents are still censored, repressed, and arrested. So again, anything that they don't like is not allowed to come to light, right? Which means instilling or having any sort of progress or change made is extremely hard because these ideas can't be shared in the first place which is just another method of barring minority groups like in this case women from speaking out against issues of violence and assault definitely here's the thing the turkish feminist movement despite all of this censorship has significantly contributed to the widespread mobilization of women in the country. So the calls for transformation in society, while seemingly minimal, have allowed for women to become more visible in the work and social life and more confident in their public appearances. The major backlash against this and even more threats on women's rights make it more apparent as to why it's so important to take a step back from the headlines in our own world and, I guess, be more cognizant of the issues plaguing those around us. More importantly, in my opinion, it highlights why taking a stand is necessary. If we look at everything we've discussed throughout this episode, and I guess we'll discuss throughout the season, the importance of a voice with persistence and re resilience in the face of adversity can bring about meaningful change. And I think we have to amplify those voices so that people can have their basic rights. I think it's important to discuss, like, bring up what feminism means, especially in Western culture more specifically in America, because that's the context I'm most familiar with. But we often see that a lot of the issues in America, while they're like super important, they often gloss over everything else that happens in the world. I mean, I know, I still, I consider myself to be a proud feminist, but I've just noticed when people are discussing feminism in the US, they're very America-centric in the issues they discuss. And they often forget about women in other countries who are dealing with stuff that we're great, lucky enough to be somewhat ignorant to. Like, while I don't think it's fair to compare issues, um, I know a lot of what the feminist movement today focuses on, I guess, is, oh, gender equality in the workplace or just ideologies in general. And while those are, of course, important issues that we definitely need to fix, um, they often overshadow these other issues, especially, I think, with the feminist account on Instagram. I know we've talked about this a little bit. Definitely. But we talk about how... <laughs> we talk, we've definitely talked about how um, it never actually draws attention to issues that we don't know about. I think a lot of the purpose of these social movements is to help women progress but what happens when those movements i guess become an echo chamber i think at the end of the day we can't achieve gender equality for women unless we take into account the problems women are facing all over the globe not just the women that we know in our situation thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode if you guys would like to continue this conversation, be sure to follow us on our Instagram at Positionality Media or email us positionalitymedia at gmail.com. We also have listener messages um, enabled for this episode, so if you would like to send us an audio message through Anchor, be sure to click on the link in our description of the episode. Other than that, be sure to tune in next time where we take a deep dive on the dark web. Bye! Bye! <laughs>